Good morning, friends. Good morning, good morning. I'm, I'm not used to being on the other side. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, thank you for the, the wishes and for all those um, celebrating. Uh, we, we pray God's blessing on you. Um, again, from my side to the, the mothers amongst us and all women who take the, the responsibility of motherhood in various different ways, Happy Mother's Day to each and every single one of you. Shall we pray together for the mothers amongst us? Gracious and loving God, we recognize that mothers come in many different forms. And today we celebrate them all. We thank you for mothers, for those women whose lives have ended and whom we miss dearly. We thank you for mothers of the past. For every woman who's working day and night to raise her children right now, we thank you for the mothers of today. For all the women who are expecting but aren't quite mothers yet, we thank you for the soon-to-be mothers. For the women who took in others' children through adoption and foster care, we thank you for the mothers with hearts so big. For those women who have lost a child to death, and must carry on, we thank you for the mothers who are so strong. For all the women who have desperately wanted to have children of their own, but chose instead to mother everyone else, we thank you for mothers in spirit. Where relationships between mothers and their children are strained or even broken, we thank you for others who have demonstrated your love for us through their care and nurture. And for mothers who continue to love despite rejection, we thank you for the way that shows your love for us, a love that never gives up. And so we thank you, Lord, for all the women who have influenced our lives in so many ways. We pray that we might honor them in everything we do. Amen. Let's continue in prayer together. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the joy that comes as we gather to worship together and are truly united as the people of God. We thank you for the family of faith, united in our desire to follow Jesus. Thank you for those with whom we have laughed with whom, who have made this world a more cheery place. Thank you for those with whom we have wept and shared our sorrows in times of need. We bless you for those who have served alongside, sharing together in a common task, whose support has made the work more manageable. We bless you for those who've shared our dreams and pursued our visions as partners in a common purpose, working to an agreed goal. Thank you for those with whom we worship together, for those with whom we pray together, for those in whose company we have listened to your voice and sought to see your face. Forgive us for everything that has interrupted the companionship we enjoy, for selfishness that made us want nothing but our own way, for intolerance which made us see nothing but our own point of view, for self-assertiveness that made us seek to impose our own will upon others. Have mercy, good God. Forgive us for arguments in which we lost our temper, for discussions in which bitter words and sarcastic comments were thrown about, for things we said in the heat of the moment and now bitterly regret. Have mercy, gracious Lord. So cleanse and purify us that in the days to come we will work to live in unity with one another because we are one in Christ. Hear this our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord as we pray together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Friends, we turn now to our scripture reading for this morning. And this morning's reading is taken from John chapter 14, verses 15 to 29. John chapter 14, verses 15 to 29. Jesus is speaking to his disciples on the night in which he will be betrayed, the night before his crucifixion. And amongst many other things, he says to them, If you love me, you will obey my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, who will stay with you forever. He is the Spirit who reveals the truth about God. The world cannot receive him, because it cannot see him or know him. But you know him, because he remains with you and is in you. When I go, you will not be left all alone. I will come back to you. In a little while, the world will not see me, but you will see me. And because I live, you also will live. When that day comes, you will know that I am in my Father and that you are in me, just as I am in you. Whoever accepts my commandments and obeys them is the one who loves me. My Father will love whoever loves me. I too will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, Lord, how can it be that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, Whoever loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and my Father and I will, and my Father and I will come to them and live with them. Whoever does not love me does not obey my teaching. And the teaching you have heard is not mine, but comes from the Father who sent me. I have told you this while I am still with you. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and make you remember all that I have told you. Peace is what I leave with you. It is my own peace. I give you. I do not give it as the world does. Do not be worried and upset. Do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am leaving, but I will come back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for he is greater than I. I have told you this now before it all happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I cannot talk with you much longer because the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me, but the world must know that I love the Father. That is why I do everything as he commands me. Come, let us go from this place. Thanks be to God for this word to us. One of my um, favorite cartoons, um, and, and I'm a great fan of, of cartoons, um, is, uh, don't put it up just yet, is, um, is, is a cartoon called Kelvin and Hobbes. Uh, does anyone here know Kelvin and Hobbes? Any Kelvin and Hobbes fans? Ah, I see a hand, Estelle, is that you? Kelvin and Hobbes? There we go, kindred spirits. Um, no other Calvin and Hobbes fans? I'm deeply disappointed. You have to, have to, have to discover 
who Calvin is, is another hand there. Yeah, another kindred spirit. You have to, have to, have to read Calvin and Hobbes. Um, I lo- okay, so just for those who don't know, Calvin is a little boy um, who, like a lot of boys, gets up to a lot of mischief. He's a boy with the most wild and vivid imagination, and he has a friend who is called Hobbes, and Hobbes is a tiger. Now, most people who, who look at, at Calvin and Hobbes would think that Hobbes is a stuffed toy, but in, um, in Calvin's mind, um, Hobbes is a real live tiger. And Calvin and Hobbes get up to all sorts of adventures and, and mischief. Um, and, and one of the things I love about Calvin and Hobbes is that it's, it, it's actually, it contains some of the most profound truths in the form of, of humor and this little boy and his vivid imagination. Um, it really does, and, and it's, it's great. So read it. Now, I've got one little cartoon Calvin and Hobbes cartoon for you this morning. Um, I hope that you're going to be able to see it. Oh, there we go. Lovely. Add it to it. Look and see. There's, yeah, that's uh, Calvin and and Hobbes. So if we can move to to the actual cartoon, I hope you can see it. Ah, there we go. Okay. So you can see that. Mom uh, is is sitting there and Calvin comes along and uh, he's wearing a helmet and a cape. Um, and mom says to him, what's up today? And he says, nothing so far. Next one. And so mom says, so far? And he says, well, you never know. Something could happen today. And then he says, and if anything does, by golly, I'm going to be ready for it. There he is with his helmet and his cape, and he is ready for anything. And mom says, I need a suit like that. I need a suit like that. Don't we all need a suit like that? I'm ready for anything. No matter what comes my way, I'm ready for it. Sometimes when I watch the evening news or read the newspaper, which I I try to avoid doing, or social media, um, or just talk with friends. It seems like our world just keeps growing more and more violent. People seem to be constantly at each other's throats. A suit like that would come in handy so that we could say with Calvin, whatever may come my way, I'm going to be ready for it. Bring it on. Now, I don't have a suit like Calvin's to give you this morning. In fact, I don't think that a suit like that really exists. That's simply the nature of living. But I can remind you of the parting promise of Jesus that we heard a little bit earlier on. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give it as the world does. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And so how can we experience this peace? What does this peace even look like? And will we even know this peace when it's there? And I I think that we may not even recognize this peace, even though it's right there in front of us. Because as Jesus says in verse 27, the peace that Jesus gives us is his own peace. And it's not as the world gives it. And so we might miss it completely because we're expecting peace the way the world speaks about peace or gives peace. And in fact, we're getting the peace that belongs to Jesus, Jesus' peace. 
When we look for peace, we look for an end to things that disturb us. We, we look for an absence of fear, an absence of conflict, an absence of turmoil. But the biblical word for peace, in particular in the Hebrew, is the word shalom. And you've probably heard that word before. In the Greek, it's eirene. But in the Hebrew language in particular, that word shalom indicates a wholeness of life that comes from a right relationship. Wholeness of life that comes from a right relationship. It's much bigger than simply an absence of conflict. It's, it's about God's life, the way that God intends for us. And it comes from a right relationship. Relationship with God, relationship with others, and even relationship with ourselves. And so... Maybe the question we should be asking is, how do we get into a right relationship with God, with others, and with ourselves? Because that's how we discover shalom, the peace that passes all understanding, Jesus' peace, God's peace. And of course, we recognize that Jesus says, this peace that I give you is my own peace. So the peace is the peace of Christ. And the, and the way that we come to right relationship with God, with others, and with ourselves is through Christ. Through Christ's death and resurrection, through Christ's life, we, that is how we come into right relationship. In verse 26, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will teach and remind you all that I have taught you. The Holy Spirit will teach and remind us of Christ and all that Christ has taught and done for us. Shortly after Jesus' crucifixion, we find the disciples locked away in fear. They don't remember what Jesus has taught them. This, all, this is all on the night before he is crucified. Three days later, or four days later, uh, three days uh, uh, on the third day after his crucifixion, they're locked away in fear. They've already forgotten all the words that Jesus taught them. They, they see and touch and eat with the risen Christ, and still they don't remember all that Jesus has taught them. Jesus appears to them more than once. And every time Jesus appears after his resurrection, he says to them, peace be with you. And he breathes his spirit onto them. But still, they don't remember. And then, and on the day of Pentecost, which we're drawing near to, the Holy Spirit empowers them, and suddenly they remember all that Jesus has taught them. They receive the peace of Christ, and the peace of Christ empowers them to go out, to open the locked doors, to go out into the midst of the face of danger, to proclaim the risen Christ. They go out, not just onto the streets, but to, to all the places that they can to be peacemakers, to be peacemakers. The peace of God through the Holy Spirit sends them out to be peacemakers. 
And so we need to ask ourselves, how do we receive this gift from the Holy Spirit? Or this gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, in that short little passage that I read, three times, verse 15, verse 21, and verse 23, Jesus says, love God, love me and obey my teachings, and God will be with you. Those who love me and obey my teachings will experience this peace. And what is Christ's teaching? What is Christ's command? The last command on that same night in which he was betrayed. A command that he had spoken over and over again. A a command that he literally gave his life for is love. Love God and love others. He said in that command everything is summed up. Everything else hangs on That love, love God and love others. And this involves an action. This is a, a, love is a verb. It's not a, it's not an emotion or a feeling. It's an action. It's a doing word. And that's why it's linked to obeying Christ. Because to love is to obey the command. And on that night in which he was betrayed, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. The command to love one another wasn't the new command. The new command was, as I love you. And how did Christ love us? Not just through words, but through action, through his entire life. Self-sacrificial, self-giving love. That's what Christ calls us to. A little bit later on, on that same night when Jesus is teaching them, he says, and it's recorded in chapter 15, verses 12 to 17, he says, my commandment is this, love one another, just as I love you. The greatest love a person can have for their friends is to give their life for them. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because a servant does not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because I have told you everything I have heard from my father. You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear much fruit, the kind of fruit that endures. And so the Father will give you whatever you ask of him in my name. Then again, this then is what I command you, love one another. Peace comes from a right relationship with God and with others. And it comes from love. Love in action. As Christ loved us, he gave his life for us. Henry Miller once said, if there is to be peace, it will come through being, not having. If there is to be peace, it will come through being, not having. William Loder, a preacher, says, we need to look less for the dwelling of God than to be the dwelling of God. In that is peace. We need to look less for the dwelling of God than to be the dwelling of God. In that is peace. Remain in 
my love. That's what Jesus says. Remain in my love. Now I just have one final word of warning in closing. God's peace is not as the world gives it. In fact, the peace that God gives us is often at odds with the world. It's in conflict with the world. And that sounds like a bit of a contradiction, but that's the reality of the peace that God gives us and the peace that God calls us to live out because it disrupts the status quo. Being a peacemaker stirs up trouble. Just look at Jesus' life. Being a peacemaker stirs up trouble because it disrupts the status quo. It lifts up the lowly and brings down the mighty. And trust me, the mighty don't like that. And so being a peacemaker can cause a lot of trouble for us. In the Upper Room Disciplines, a book of daily devotions that I use and I highly recommend, um, it, I, I came across this, this uh, quote uh, or this phrase that just leapt out at me. In fact, the whole of, of Friday's devotion uh, kind of was like a, a, a credo, my, my, the way that I, I, I understand our calling. But the, the author said, the resurrection disrupts the categories of the cycle of life and death. So too does living in the community of the resurrected one. It puts one out of step with a world dominated by the cycle of death. Isn't that profound? The resurrection disrupts the categories of the cycle of life and death. The resurrection disrupts the categories of life and death. And it puts us in step with a world dominated by the cycle of death. But that often creates conflict. Again, a little bit later on, in chapter 15 and verses 18 to 19, Jesus says, If the world hates you, just remember that it has hated me first. If you belonged to the world, then the world would love you as its own. But I chose you from this world, and you do not belong to it. That is why the world hates you. And then a little bit later on in chapter 16, from verse 1, Jesus says, I have told you this so that you will not give up your faith. You will be expelled from the synagogues, and the time will come when anyone who kills you will think that by doing this, they are serving God. People will do these things to you because they have not known either the Father or me. But I have told you this, so that when the time comes for them to do these things, you will remember what I told you. And so Jesus warns them that when you love, when you become peacemakers, there will be conflict. Because the love of God disrupts the cycle of life and death. And in particular of death. And so all those who serve death will oppose us. Because we speak life. Loving people often means that you get hurt. Peace is not the absence of pain or conflict or turmoil or fear. Peace is seeking to be in a right relationship with God first and then with others. It is love in action. Self-sacrificial, self-giving love. 
that brings down the mighty and raises up the lowly. The Holy Spirit reminds us that Christ had to suffer and die and rise again in order that we might have the example of perfect peace that disrupts the cycle of life and death, acts against all that that seeks to rob us of life. And so as we remain in the love of Christ, we sustain hope and healing as we reimagine a world filled with and shaped by the love of God. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord God, that you take the weariness and tiredness, our weariness and tiredness, and that you pick up those who have fallen. You raise up those who are brought low. And so we pray for those who are bowed down under the burdens they must carry. We pray for those who are crushed by their responsibilities those who feel the pain of our world, who marvel that others can seem so indifferent to the pain around us. Help them to keep on going. Being, bring supportive friends alongside them. Give them tokens of your grace, fresh vision and courage, and signs of encouragement in their struggle. We pray for those who are lonely and for whom the passing years have taken all their friends and contemporaries. Bless those who are shy, who find it hard to initiate conversation and have never known real friends. We pray for strangers in a foreign land, for asylum seekers and refugees separated by language and culture from familiar ways and much-loved customs. We remember all those who, even in the midst of crowds, feel alone. Help the church, we pray, to be a place of acceptance and belonging, a place of welcome and inclusion where all can find a home, a listening ear, a friendly smile and a helping hand. Thank you that you bind up the brokenhearted and comfort those who mourn. Bless those whose hearts are sore today. Be very close to those whose family circle has been invaded and whose joy has been darkened by death. We remember those who have lost loved ones for whom they've cared, whose needs they've met, whose lives have been so intertwined that they still listen for a voice they'll never hear again. We remember wives who have lost husbands and husbands who have lost wives, parents who have lost children, who find their homes strangely silent and empty now, and children who have lost parents, who are confused by a world that seems less secure and more frightening than before, and for all for whom familiar places and sounds and smells awaken memories that bring tears in their wake. Thank you for our faith. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. We turn to you in trust and recommit ourselves to you. Send us out today and every day with the joy that no one can take from us, the life which is your life and the hope that gives strength to our actions. Help us to sing of our faith and in that singing, Find our strength to go on. Trusting in Jesus who lived among us, died for us and rose again. And who prays for us today, even as we pray to him. In his name we pray. Amen. Shall we all stand together now as we share God's blessing on one another. And prepare to be a blessing to the world. We say together. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
It's a good peace and may God's peace go with you.